Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. We are honored once again to be joined by Paula Francisi. She's the, in fact, the Peter W. Rodino Professor of Law at Seton Hall Law School. Good to see you, Professor. It is so good to see you, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Our pleasure. Paula, you've always been very helpful in putting judicial issues in context for us. The situation, I don't want to date ourselves because we're taping on the 20th of September being seen later. People are being nominated to the state Supreme Court. We don't know about the approval process. Let's just say it's a little political at times, just a little. What does it mean when the full complement of seven state Supreme Court justices are not in place? What does that mean for the judicial system and for those who seek justice? Well, it, it, it is quite important that the New Jersey Supreme Court be fully constituted in seven justices that are supposed to, by tradition and longstanding history, represent both parties to assure that the court stays above the fray, as it always has, to be nonpartisan. Right now, the court has four members with three members called up by Chief Justice Ravner from the appellate division all three of whom are immensely well qualified, but they're only interim appointees. It's very, very important for stability and also for the orderly administration of justice to have that full bench in place. Our state Supreme Court is the gem of our state. It's been referred to with great praise by the New York Times as New Jersey's New York Yankees for good reason. It is a ghosty. Well, no, I'm a Yankee fan, and I'm not sure they'd be referred to the Yankees of today. But my, what I mean by that is the Supreme Court of then, when that was said, is not the Supreme Court of now. It is by many folks who understand this process and the politics of it and state senators who block appointments. There's something called senatorial courtesy, which is yes. not in the state Supreme, excuse me, not in the state 1947 Constitution, but it is a practice unwritten that you state senators from a county where a judge is nominated to be on the, or someone is nominated to be on the state Supreme Court, that senator can block and has blocked appointments to the Supreme Court. Based on what? It depends. Based oftentimes, at least theoretically, on assuring a healthy partisan, bipartisan balance to make certain that the court is a fully and equally represented branch of government. Senatorial courtesy cuts both ways, as you're noting. On the one hand, it is a check against unbridled power exercised by the governor and the legislative uh, majority. On the other hand, it can be a delaying tactic. It can be a politics as usual tactic. What I can tell you as a keen observer of the court is that irrespective of party affiliation when nominated, it's been my experience that the New Jersey State Supreme Court justices abide that long tradition of rising above the political labels to do justice, to do what's right. I think the court is the New York Yankees. If you're a Yankees fan, as I am, of the state, the process that gets judges to the bench leaves a lot to be desired. But, but Paul, here's, here's, here's the perplexing part for me. And P.S., I want to be clear, Democrats and Republicans in the state legislation, and people may wondering, what does it have to do with the Senate? The governor nominates someone to be on the Supreme Court. The right. states must approve or reject that nominee or not even consider that nominee. That being said, which is similar to the United States uh, Constitution, excuse me, United States Supreme Court uh, Associate Justice, if, if you will, nominated by the president, the Senate has to act or not act. That being said, what is the role of party affiliation? If we're saying they're impartial, if we're saying they, the law is what matters, then what the heck is the difference what their party affiliation is if party affiliation has no place in adjudicating a judicial issue. Because perception is important and the court, uh, our state Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court has long been concerned with its perception. It needs to enjoy the public confidence. It also needs to communicate to the public that it is a representative, full and equal branch of government. So the idea of a 4-3 split on our seven-member comprised court is important. It's an important tradition to preserve. Okay. So let me nationalize this. As we speak, 
the United States Supreme Court judges across this nation have incredible power to make difficult decisions in an incredibly polarized, divided nation. And I'm not asking you to comment on the situation in Mar-a-Lago that'll play out. We don't want to date ourselves. But when an, an appellate court judge in Florida makes a decision as to whether a special master is appointed or not, again, don't date ourselves. And it's applauded by those who are supporters of, of former President Trump because she's a Trump supporter. I don't know if that's true or not, but just the, I'll go back to perception. Why would it even be relevant whether a, ju a judge is a Trump supporter, a Biden supporter, voted Democrat, or Republican? The law is the law, the Constitution is the Constitution, or am I being naive? No, I, I, I don't think you're being naive. I, I think that what you're re reflecting is part of the genius of our framers when devising this tripartite system of government. The courts are supposed to serve as umpires. Chief Justice Roberts famously said that. They call balls and strikes. They are not to legislate from the bench. They are to be fair, impartial adjudicators. The problem is that judges do not work in a vacuum. They're serving in a hyper-politicized, hyper-partisan culture. The media does an awful lot to contribute to the uh, punditry and to stoking lots of the divisions, which are clickbait for people. Um, I think that as a nation, we are, as a people, far more reasonable than the um, portrayal of the very polarized, divisive uh, splits that we read about and hear about constantly in the media. And I also think that special master, you know, there's a great Buddhist wisdom, was it wise, was it not? And the answer is always, we'll see. Because right now, there are many who initially applauded the appointment of the special master who are deriding the appointment. So time will tell. But again, I remain very, very confident, confident, <laughs> I hope confident, but very confident in our, our great social experiment, this great democracy. Uh, real quick on this, and in P.S., uh, we will not date ourselves because it will play out the way it plays out, that issue and others. Can I get a response to this? President Biden is turning 80 relatively soon. Uh, Donald Trump, if he were to run again, mid-70s, beyond. Um, why is there a mandatory retirement age at 70 in the Supreme Court in New Jersey? And is, does that make sense? No, I do not think it makes sense. As a matter of my opinion, 70 is is not what it may have been perceived to have been generations ago. Uh, 70, a vibrant decade. The 80s, a vibrant decade for so many of the most acclaimed jurists in our country, who often, history tells, served beautifully on the U.S. Supreme Court well into their 90s. 70 is too young. The and the mandatory retirement age in New Jersey, it has to be changed. We've got a crisis right now in unfilled positions on the state bench. We'll have another 15 or so vacancies in December when 16 judges hit the mandatory retirement age. To Professor Francis's point, there is no retirement age for the United States Supreme Court, but there is one at 70 for the New Jersey Supreme Court. We'll follow this. And P.S., uh, Professor Francisi will be joining us on our other series I do with Jackie Tricarico, our executive producer and co-anchor of Remember Them. We'll be talking about uh, very significant jurists in the state of New Jersey who passed away but had a great impact on our lives. Paula, thank yeah. you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. You got to stay with us. We'll be right back. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, the New Jersey Education Association, Summit Health, RWJ Barnabas Health, PSE&G, Bank of America, Eastern Atlantic States Regional Council of Carpenters, NJM Insurance Group, Fedway Associates, Inc., and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State and by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by New Jersey Monthly. 
NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the men and women who teach our children, the public sector employees who maintain our infrastructure, the workers who craft our manufactured goods, and New Jersey's next generation of leaders, the people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.